while he was out there, he saw all the lot, the sights, the lions, the zebras, the antelope, the wildebeests. It was a dream trip. The highlight of the trip was when they had a chance to see the elephants at the water hole, and the excitement was building up as they were going there. They made it to the watering hole, and, and ju it was just as advertised. There were hundreds of elephants there, and they were drinking and splashing and playing and having a great time. But a few hundred yards off, there was an elephant that was not with the others. As the man looked through his binoculars, he had noticed the elephant was stuck in what appeared to be a hunter's trap. The elephant was flailing and trying to get out, but he couldn't. The man could see the small, uh, uh, the small button on the side that could open that trap and decided to head over, the, over to the elephant. This man, against all the team members' warning, got out of the jeep, ran over to the elephant, let him out, and everyone thought the elephant would trample him, but the elephant stopped. He looked at the man, raised his trunk and his, his uh, leg uh, as if to say thank you, and the elephant just stood there with his trunk up and his leg kind of pointing at him and, uh, and did that for about a minute, and the man realized he had done a great thing. Let's fast forward a few years. This man was at the zoo with his family, and while he was there, they had wandered near the elephant exhibit, and they were looking at the elephants, and by now, this was a number of years later, the man had almost forgotten his own elephant experience until, while looking at the other elephants, he saw one, staring right at him, lifting up his trunk and almost nodding. That's the one, he said. That, that's the one I saved at the safari 15 years ago. I, I have to see him. Against his family's warnings, he climbs over the large bars and jumps down into the elephant exhibit, walks over to his good friend, places his hand on that elephant. The elephant reaches over with his trunk, picks up the man, and slams his body up against a nearby tree about 15 times and dropped the lifeless body to the ground and walked away. It wasn't him. The moral of the story is, no matter how much you believe something is true or um, no matter how right you think something is, if it's wrong, it doesn't become any truer if you be believe harder. The thing actually must be true. Many of the misconceptions about heart disease fall into this category. We have lived life a certain way, staying away from fat and eating more whole grains because we were told these things are healthy. We're a society who at this time is almost being financed by a drug industry and unfortunately that fuels much of the research and the facts we know about. I'm here to tell you that some of these facts are, are more theories and some of this might just be outright wrong in order to get you to buy into the multi-billion dollar statin medication injury, uh, industry. excuse me. But if you want to be really healthy, you'll want to be aware of those lies and overcome them with some great healthy steps. It's time for a heart health IQ test. I'm going to ask you a few questions and you can answer them. And by the end of this book, we will see where your heart health IQ ranks. Question number one, which is not a major contributor to heart attack rates? A, carbohydrate intake, B, trans fat consumption, or C, total cholesterol levels. Question number two, which does not lead to increased heart attack rates? Is it A, stress, B, inflammation, C, high sugar intake, or D, saturated fat? Number three, true or false? Statin medication is the most effective way to prevent deaths from heart disease. Number four, which of these supplements will not help prevent the real risk of heart disease or the real risk factors of heart disease? Is it A, magnesium, B, CoQ10, is it C, omega-3 fatty acids, is it D, vitamin E, E, all of the above, or F, none of the above. Thank you. Now, as we go through this uh, workshop, we'll be able to answer these questions and many more. Your heart depends on it. Now, let's talk about the first question. Which of these does not affect deaths due to heart disease? You have three choices, carbohydrate consumption, trans fat levels, and total cholesterol. Let's go ahead and start by leaving out the trans fats because by now, most of us know that trans fats are some of the worst things out there. We all remember years ago that trans fats were touted as being heart healthy, but we now know that this is furthest from the truth. Today, no one in the world really would argue that trans fats are very good for you, except for someone who could profit from it. Now you're left with two choices, total cholesterol and carbohydrate consumption. And the answer? 
total cholesterol. This may take you by surprise. What do you mean total cholesterol won't affect heart disease? That's why I'm taking this expensive statin drug, right? Well, let, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, if you're taking uh, an expensive statin drug, I'm, I'm sorry because the research uh, is in and it really doesn't add up. Let's go ahead and go back to the beginning. There was a great study called the Seven Country Study that looked at the rates of heart attacks compared to the diets of people in those areas. The goal of the study was to see if a certain diet would cause more heart disease. The head researcher had 22 countries that had been studied, and so he compiled, compiled the results of seven of those countries and came to the conclusion that those countries with the highest cholesterol in their diet had the highest amount of heart disease. A landmark study, seven countries, thousands of people, and they had their proof. Cholesterol in the diet leads to heart disease. But if you look at the study closer, you realize it's not that simple. I did mention there were 22 countries studied, but he only used seven. And those seven were the countries that proved his hypothesis. The only problem was there were 15 other countries that would have disproved his theories if he used all of their data. When another country or when another researcher tried to use the data to uh, provide an opposing viewpoint, it was actually rejected by the World Health Organization because it didn't use all the data. It's too bad they didn't have those same scruples when the initial study was done. Now you could look at two different countries and both could have the same levels of cholesterol, but their heart disease rates were vastly different. The way to handle that? get rid of the country that doesn't support your conclusion and that's exactly what the seven country study did now just so you know um, for for any of you that are interested in any of the research that we're providing here um, I will have this linked in some way to this workshop so you will be able to get that um, so it's so interesting how how this this research study that didn't use all the data but use what it needed to, to to sort of prove that cholesterol was a problem this was the beginning it was a it, it began the statin revolution um, this study was revolutionary never were never were so many people studied and when it was found that cholesterol levels were tied to heart disease or so they thought researchers then started to develop effective medication to remove cholesterol from the body and they were pretty effective at doing so. Over time, statin drugs were developed that were very effective at lowering cholesterol. Now, while statin drugs were shown to be effective at removing cholesterol, they weren't nearly as effective at reducing deaths due to heart disease. In fact, in most population, there was no positive effect at all when it came to reducing deaths, which is the whole reason why we take these medications, right? We know that heart disease is the number one killer in America. Over 600,000 people every year die because of heart disease. That's about one out of every four deaths in our country. If you think cholesterol is a major player in heart disease, you would do anything to reduce your risk, wouldn't you? Like take really expensive medications to reduce that cholesterol. The problem is, cholesterol, while high numbers aren't necessarily something to jump up and down about, they aren't the problem child that they're made to look like. Imagine you're in school and you see a kid who gets in trouble all the time. He talks a little too loudly, he fidgets in his chair uh, a little too much, and he asks about 75 questions a day, and, and, and they're annoying, and, and they spend, they're sent to the principal's office seemingly all the time for talking too much. Um, those are, are kids that, that can be a bit of a problem in school. But actually, there are other kids who bully others, who set the classroom on fire, who vandalize their community and other inc do other incredibly destructive things. But they're, they're so quiet about it that they rarely get caught. Now, a question for you. Which kid is the worst? Definitely the second. But why is the first always getting into trouble? Cholesterol is like that first kid. Pretty easy to detect, to detect. Um, the kid's kind of loud and annoying, and cholesterol is the same. You can see it in the arteries of people in heart disease. You can do a pretty simple blood test to see it, so it must be the culprit. They've developed medications that would reduce cholesterol in the blood, and it's very effective at doing that. So it just makes sense that it would prevent deaths, and they would uh, provide, um, uh, let's see, and, and, and they would provide the statistics to prove their point that it does so. 33% fewer deaths. 
A landmark statin drug study showed that their drug resulted in fewer deaths. But I want you to understand the difference between relative and absolute figure, figures. For example, if a study were to measure 100 people and three of them died of heart disease in a control group and two of them died in the statin drug group, officially the difference between three and two is 33% if you're looking at the relative, um, the, the relative figures. However, when you look at absolute numbers, the results aren't so exciting. The number of deaths of that 100 person group was, was 3% of the group. Then the statin drug, um, uh, the number of deaths from the statin drug group was 2%, which is really only a 1% change in the actual number of deaths per person in the study. That is not nearly as exciting as the other statistic, but you can manipulate those numbers enough and advertise it to the world since 99% of the world won't take the time to actually study these numbers, then we're all convinced. Is it really something that's worth expensive medications that can have some pretty serious side effects for a 1% change in the number of deaths that happen? That's for you to decide. Here are a couple of other studies. The Framingham Heart Study. An attempt to find a link between heart disease and cholesterol levels. After the study, it was found that those with high cholesterol had the same amount of heart attacks as those with low cholesterol. This was a major study that shows that cholesterol was not the cause of heart disease. Women's Health Initiative, another study, an eight-year study in women to see if low-fat diets affect heart disease in women. The end of the study showed that low-fat diets had no effect. But it's not all the doctor's fault. It was really believed that cholesterol was the cause of heart disease. So they went after cholesterol successfully. Unfortunately, they went after the wrong culprit. They went after the wrong kid. The fact is, cholesterol medications do not reduce heart disease in any real life way. The one population where it appears that there is some benefit is in males who have already had a heart attack. Uh, but it's a tiny representation of the uh, of the population that's on static statin drugs. Why isn't it changing? Quite possibly because $30 billion are spent on statin, statin drugs annually. But the fact is, you will not prevent cardiac death by reducing cholesterol. You will not prevent cardiac death by taking statin medications. Again, unless you're a male who has already had a heart attack. So if not cholesterol, then what? Uh, cholesterol is that loud child in the room, but it's not the true troublemaker actually causing the problems that affect our lives. Fat? What about fat? Fat seems to be the next logical choice in the battle against heart disease. Um, and this is going to be our, we'll, we'll call it line number two. Fat has many distinctions, but I'm going to narrow this down into three really important ones. We have saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fats. And it's widely known that the polyunsaturated fats are good for you. Um, it's widely known, so we won't spend a whole lot of time in that area. But the area we're going to spend more time on is saturated fat. Saturated fat is the fat that at room temperature, it's solid. It's found in animal fats, meat, cheese, butter, eggs, excuse me, coconut oil, and palm oil. It's stable at high temperatures. It doesn't break down. Every heart health organization has fought against saturated fat calling it the cause of heart disease because it raises cholesterol. However, we know it's not uh, something that causes heart disease. When you look at the studies, you find out there's a major flaw. The only relation that saturated fat has on the body is that it raises slightly total cholesterol. Now, we understand that cholesterol has no real effect on the death rates due to heart disease, so it doesn't really matter that these foods slightly raise total cholesterol. Now, the other thing, saturated fat, even though it slightly raises cholesterol, it actually raises HDL, high-density lipoproteins, more than the LDL formation. So if we're thinking of, say, good cholesterol and quote-unquote bad cholesterol, saturated fat actually raises the good cholesterol more than the other. So although the cholesterol count is higher, the ratio of good to bad cholesterol is still in a safe range. It is improved with a higher saturated fat in the diet. So in a sense, they're right. Saturated fat increases cholesterol, but we know cholesterol causes no problems. Um, and it will increase cholesterol in a way that's actually really healthy for the body. So fat is not our problem as well. 
at least not saturated fat like it's been made out to be. So we still don't know that underlying cause of the heart disease deaths. And actually we do. It's just not the things that everyone's talking about. It's not the loud child in the room. That loud child is cholesterol, easy to test for, the thing we can see in arteries, the things that we can take a medication and start to decrease it, so it must be the problem, only it's not. The things that are actually causing the deaths due to heart disease are four things, inflammation, oxidation, stress, and sugar. Inflammation. There are two types of inflammation. Number one is acute inflammation. This happens when you have an injury and your body is attempting to heal it. You'll get platelets to stop the bleeding. Other cells come by um, uh, to, to begin that healing process. This process will continue until the injury is healed. However, inflammation that is long-term or chronic will affect the blood vessels, the endothelium, when the endothelium, that inner lining of the blood vessels, is injured constantly, you'll have platelets come in to seal off the injury. You'll have the small, bad cholesterol particles attached to that injured area, and this will lead to thickening of that artery. If you continue to have that inflammation in the lining of the arteries, the injury continues to happen, further weakening those arteries, causing an eventual rupture or a... Or a um, abrupt closing off of that artery. This can happen throughout the body and this process always happens if there is chronic inflammation. One of the keys to reducing major risk factors for heart attacks is to reduce this chronic inflammation. I mean, it's re this is a really important area because uh, when we think of heart disease, sometimes we think of that, that slow process of, of plaque formation and that slow process over a long period of time leading to these heart attacks. And actually, um, that slow process can happen our entire lives. And, and, and it's amazing you'll see people with, with 90 to 95% closure of their arteries due to that slow process still living life pretty healthy because our body has been able to figure out ways to compensate for those kinds of issues. However, it's the abrupt um, body response to that, that injury in those blood vessels that actually creates the actual heart attacks. That's our, our major problem and the major killer that we have with heart disease. Number two, oxidative stress. Our bodies are, are growing and dying by the minute. And there are molecules that are communicating with them constantly. If those mo molecules fall under the category of free radicals, then they're looking for a place to bind. And when those little molecules bind to something, it oxidizes inside the body, uh, which inside the body, oxidation is very dangerous. Um, oxidation causes injury to the body's tissues, and when this happens in the heart lining, the endothelium, injury occurs. When injury occurs, that unstable plaque can form, um, and this is the whole reasoning why antioxidants can be helpful in reducing this oxidative stress and reducing that damage to the endothelial lining. This is why powerful antioxidants like uh, resveratrol, which is found in red wine, um, have been shown to decrease the number um, uh, of the or the rate of heart attacks in people, not because of their effect on cholesterol, but because of their effect on um, inflammation and oxidation, um, they are decreasing uh, heart attack rates. Number three, sugar. Sugar is a far bigger danger than fat ever was. I will repeat, sugar is a far bigger danger than fat ever was. Fat was innocent all the time. It was sugar. Sugar is the surprising research finding. Why? There's a process in the body, it's called glycation, which by itself isn't a problem, but when glycation happens, we have these things called glycation end products, and I'm going to explain that in, in just a little bit more detail. According to Dr. Warren Matthews of Extend Life, glycation is even more dangerous to your health than free radicals. It's important that you understand what it is, how it is caused, and how to protect yourself against it. In order to appreciate the problems associated with glycation, there are some basic biological facts you need to be aware of. Firstly, the role that proteins play in your body. Proteins are valuable biological molecules which are found in almost every part of your body and have a variety of functions. They are present inside cells, making the life of the cell possible. Without them, you would not survive as these proteins are needed to carry oxygen and nutrients to the tissues. Proteins are made up of strings of different amino acids. To function properly, they need to be free agents, 
In other words, they need to remain as singular molecules to move around and perform their task. So far, so good. However, protein has enemies, uh, and they're exposed to them every day. These enemies are in the form of glucose molecules, sugars, and similar chemicals known as aldehydes. All these molecules can be referred to loosely as glycating agents. These enemies try to attach themselves to protein molecules. When they do this, it is the start of a dangerous situation. Why? Well, when the glycating agent attacks itself to a protein molecule, the combined molecule is a bit like a particle floating around with a little bit of superglue stuck to it. If that bit of glue comes in contact with another protein, then that combined molecule may attach itself to that free agent protein in a process referred to as cross-linking. These advanced glycation end products are the things you see in people as they get older. Plaque formation, hardening of blood vessels, chronic inflammatory issues over time cause the failure, over, uh, cause the failure of the heart. Things we don't want... Um, the reason why this happens is not because of one meal with sugar, but a lifetime of sugar consumption. The rising and falling of our blood sugar happens over time, and our bodies will become insulin resistant. This is another thing that happens. Insulin is actually anti-inflammatory, but by the time we become insulin resistant, which is common in most American adults today, then this process is reversed, and we're in a pro-inflammatory state all the time every time we eat because we're eating all the time and we're resistant to in insulin's anti-inflammatory effects. So these advanced glycation end products, these super glue-like particles that form inside the body along with our body becoming insulin resistant um, are what causes the inflammation and the little particles that, that, that then lead to more instance of heart disease. Uh, real world notes. There was a study of 31,000 people that showed that people who ate 25% of all their calories from sugar had four times the instance of heart disease compared to those who had under 10% of their diets of sugar, uh, from sugar. Sugar is the real villain. It has caused more problems with heart disease than fat and cholesterol ever did. And because our children's diets are so high in sugar, their heart disease rates are greatly increased as well. Stress. Stress is a vitally important component to fighting heart disease. Here's why. Let's think about life in prehistoric times. What do you think were the stresses that happened at that time for us um, cavemen or early men in early times when we were hunters and gatherers? When an, early, when an early man came in contact with a stressor, let's say a lion or a thief, his body would undergo a tremendous transformation. The heart rate would increase, the blood pressure would increase, and blood flow would increase to the eyes, arms, and legs. This is what we know as the fight or flight response. This allows the early man to fight the predator or run from it. And while we were created in a way uh, to do, and we were created in a way to be able to do that job effectively. This is an example of the acute stress response, and it's an amazing thing. But the stresses that we go through now are work, home, finances. These things aren't things that last a couple of minutes at a time. For most of us, those stresses will stay with us every minute of every day. If your heart rate and blood pressure is elevated for an extended period of time uh, like that, it would create a lot of turbulence in our blood vessels. You combine that with the high levels of inflammation in the body due to sugar consumption. You combine that with the high levels of glycation in products, those sticky molecules um, that tend to stick inside our arteries. You have a re recipe for blood vessel injury depending on the type of cholesterol you have predominantly in the body. The small BB-like par particles, um, half of the LDL molecules we talked about before, you're risking a great accident and a high likelihood of heart complications. Here's a real-world example, the Rosetto effect. There's a study that uh, happened in Rosetto, Pennsylvania. The studies, they studied the people of Rosetto and they found out that there was a marked decrease in heart disease instances than in the general public. And, and, and this is a big difference. Roughly 50% of what you would see in the general population, that was what you saw in Rosetto. Only half the heart attack rates as you'd see in other places. So they studied the people very closely. And what did they find? Were they eating less fat than the general population? No. In fact, they ate more fat and definitely more saturated fat than other populations. Did they smoke? Um, 
Uh, yes, they seem to smoke more than the uh, general population. Uh, did they, maybe, maybe it's because they refrain from alcohol. No, they seem to drink more than the general American population. So what was the difference? The answer? Stress. The people of Rosetto, Pennsylvania had difficult mining jobs. They didn't eat very regularly. They smoked and drank. But they also had a strong, solid family system. In their homes, there was an extended family that usually spanned three generations. This kind of support system lowers stress levels dramatically, and you can see it in the results of the Rosetta study. Want to lower your chance of heart disease? Uh, lower your stress. Improve your connections to family and friends and be on your way to better health. So, what do I do with this information? Now that we know that cholesterol is not the killer it's made out to be, that it doesn't cause increased cardiac death, where do we go from here? Well, here are a couple of steps that we need to follow. One, if you really want to assess your actual heart disease risk, you have to lower, you have to, um, uh, you can have your doctor run these tests. And, and no, none of them are total cholesterol. This will tell you if you're really at risk for heart disease. Number one, LDL part, particle size. A small, a pattern A profile, large, fluffy, good versions of the LDL cholesterol is what you want. A pattern B profile, small, BB-like particles are the ones that cause damage and are directly related to heart disease mortality. CRP, C-reactive protein, it's a biomarker for internal inflammation. The more C-reactive protein you have, the greater chance you have of heart disease mortality. Uh, fibrinogen. You want fibrinogen. It supports optimal blood flow. Uh, serum ferritin. Uh, iron must be re regulated well. A process called hemochromatosis happens if there's too much iron in the blood. So you do want to monitor that. Serum ferritin is what we're looking for. LPA, lipoprotein A, is a cholesterol, a specific type of cholesterol carrying molecule. When lipoprotein A is too high, it damages blood vessels, which leads to a really high amount of plaque. Elevated LPA is a very serious ri risk factor, which has no pharmaceutical treatment. It's also been shown, though, that fish oil and niacin can help decrease LPA. Oh, yeah, statin drugs increase LPA. Another reason to think about staying away. Homocysteine. Uh, homocysteine is a, a molecule that contributes to heart disease, sticky plaques, and damages the interior artery walls. Um, to decrease homocysteine, you'll need folic acid, B12, and B6. Uh, interleukin-7. Uh, interleukin-7 is an inflammatory marker. You want to test for that and, and make sure your interleukin-7 is low. 0 to 2 picograms per milliliter uh, are what we're looking for there. A coronary calcification scan. Coronary calcification is a great indicator of heart disease. If you actually have calcification in the arteries, um, that is a sign that we can have issues there. Now that's different than calcification in the blood, so we don't have to get those confused and think that one will, will create problems that, that you wouldn't see in another. Um, Okay, let's talk about some foods that we're going to want to eliminate. So we now have some tests that we're going to do. Now there's some things that we want to get rid of. So let's go into foods. Number one, um, foods to eliminate. Sugar, soda, processed carbs, or anything that comes in a package. Heart disease is significantly greater in people who eat high glycemic carbohydrates. Remove trans fats. Remove processed meats. Remove excess vegetable oils. Now, eat more of these. Wild salmon, berries and cherries, vegetables, nuts, beans, dark chocolate, garlic and turmeric, green tea and red wine, extra virgin olive oil, garlic. Over 1,200 studies have been done on garlic. Lowers triglyceride levels and is an anticoagulant. It's an anti-inflammatory, it's an antibiotic, so many different benefits of garlic. Um, supplements that can help. Coenzyme Q10 is a, a very important supplement. Um, there's a particular supplement that we offer here through Standard Process that contains a natural form of coenzyme Q10 that's designed to maintain the heart's energy stores. This is something that's depleted as we get older 
and very depleted if we're taking statin medications. Um, Ultra Meal Plus, it's a meal replacement that's combined with a healthy diet. It'll help you to lose weight and manage a condition called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a collection of symptoms, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, uh, large waist circumference, and a raised fasting glucose. When you have those things, uh, Ultra Meal Plus has been shown to be able to help with each of these areas. Plus, it lowers cholesterol. However, we know at this point that lowering cholesterol really isn't our ultimate goal here. Um, number three, actively handle your stress. Prayer, meditation, deep breathing have been shown to create some of the relaxation that uh, your body needs to help you deal with stress. Play. When I say play, I don't mean go on an activity that has a goal, but just have fun. Find something that you do that is just fun with no pressure involved and immerse yourself in it. Stress levels reduce dramatically when we take time to play. Number three, cultivate strong relationships. Like we saw in the Rosetta study, when we have those strong relationships, our stress levels decrease and our heart disease rate, our heart attack rates, decrease drastically. And that's a goal that we want to have. Um, for more information, um, you, you've learned a number of different things today. Uh, we've learned some of the lies that are, that, are, um, that are out there regarding heart disease, whether it's uh, the cholesterol myth, whether it's uh, what we know or what we don't know about fats and their role, uh, whether it's sugar and the role that it plays, uh, whether it's the statin drugs and their actual effect on, on death rates when it comes to heart disease, um, you know now the truth about those different areas. We know what to do, um, the, the nutritional aspect as far as, as far as things to eat and things to drink and, and things to put into our bodies that are going to help us decrease, decrease heart disease. We know about um, different supplements that you can take, the CoQ10 we had mentioned, the Ultra Meal Plus um, that we had mentioned as well. Very important things. Deal with it, dealing with the stress, if you put those different pieces together, um, you will see some amazing, amazing changes in, in the, the, your, your chances of having heart disease. Uh, we, we know that when we do these things, they can be much more powerful than, than those medications that we can take. If you want any more information, uh, the seminar notes, the research reports, um, to get abstracts from the articles used in the study, uh, in the workshop audio program, um, if, you, if you need any of those things, just click on the link below um, for the extra notes that are available from this workshop. Um, also, I have a very special offer for you today. Um, the two supplements that we had mentioned before, the cardiotrophin, uh, which contains the natural form of CoQ10 that, that maintains the heart's energy stores, and the Ultra Meal Plus, the meal replacement um, that, that will help manage some of those metabolic syndrome um, uh, symptoms that we had mentioned before. Together, those two supplements retail for $72. Today, um, you can get those two supplements plus three of our video workshops, Healthy Ways to Deal with Stress, that's $49, Five Reasons Weed is Killing You and What to Do About It, and Eight Steps to Strengthen Your Immune System uh, audio program. Each of those programs uh, have a value of $49, so that's about $219 worth of products. But if you order today, you can receive both of the supplements and all of those uh, other information products for $59. It's about 75% off of what it would cost retail. So to um, take advantage of that, to get $219 worth of products for only $59, um, you'll, you'll strengthen your heart and move your body towards greater health. You can click on the um, Buy Supplements Now link below and you can order that there. I am Dr. Emil Tompkins. I wish you a, a great and healthy week. I, I hope that you take some really wonderful steps in improving your chances, um, improving your, your ability to fight off heart disease. Have a great day.